you consider interdisciplinarity, we must also consider disciplinarity. Interdisciplinary work cannot exist without the disciplines. Let us consider a favorite fruit. This fruit is nourishing and delicious. If we add other fruits alongside this fruit, we have something else that is nourishing and delicious, a fruit salad. Sometimes we want to savor our single fruit, sometimes we want to join it with other fruits. And sometimes... Sometimes we want to blend the fruits together into a unique concoction, the fruit smoothie. In this metaphor, we have the differences between disciplinarity, multidisciplinarity, and interdisciplinarity. Multidisciplinarity brings disciplines together in a salad. Each discipline maintains its borders, its unique features, its singular flavor. Interdisciplinarity is about blending and melding and interconnecting, about seeking new flavors in the mix. This is not a value judgment. Sometimes you want to eat a single fruit. Sometimes you want a fruit salad. Sometimes you want a smoothie. What, though, are we blending? There are countless answers to that question, depending on the project, depending on the disciplines involved, depending on, well, many things. But for our purposes here, let us simply say that disciplines generally have three features that distinguish them from other disciplines. Content, methods, and epistemologies. Content and methods I don't really need to explain, but epistemologies is, I tell students, a cocktail party word, a word uh, that is useful to know when you want to impress people at cocktail parties, as one does. Matt's ideas are interesting, but I do question his epistemology. Epistemology means theory of knowledge. It means what counts as knowledge in your discipline, and how that knowledge is valued and analyzed. Your epistemology determines what you consider valid evidence, and how you value that evidence. Think of it this way. Content is the what of your discipline. Methods are the how, and epistemology is the why. Often when there are conflicts between disciplines, they are not conflicts of content or even methods so much as conflicts of epistemology. I don't know what they have to say. It makes no difference anyway. Whatever it is, I'm against it. We could spend an entire seminar discussing epistemology, but that's not why we're here. For practical purposes, let's save the nuances for another time and take it as a given that disciplines have content, methods, and epistemologies. You're telling me? When we get all interdisciplinary, we bring our content, methods, and epistemologies together and see what happens when they mingle, what new content, methods, and epistemologies they create. Or think of it this way. To work interdisciplinarily is to work creatively and reflectively, to be inventive, to be collaborative, and to seek synthesis. And not just synthesis, but synergy, something greater than the sum of its parts. It's important to note that interdisciplinary work does not mean giving up the standards of disciplinary work. Kathy Davidson, in her wonderful book, The New Education, said, You free faculty not by insisting they give up the standards of their traditional discipline in order to accept the standards of someone else's. Rather, you reward them and their students for constantly rethinking options, trying new programs, acting inventively and boldly, collaboratively and synthetically. A recent article in Inside Higher Ed by Paul Hanstedt, who popularized the term wicked problems for curriculum, vividly illustrates how the era of COVID-19 particularly encourages an interdisciplinary approach. Please pardon a long quotation, but 
These examples highlight the practical importance of interdisciplinarity now. Henstedt writes, If nothing else, the global pandemic is breaking the boundary between static university learning and the wicked fluidity of the world. Students in the sciences now understand that science is helpless without sound public policy. Students studying religion now see the interaction between theology, politics, sociology, economics, and health playing out in real time. Ethicists are already exploring the decision-making processes at the national and local levels. Poets, painters, photographers, and novelists are seeing their words, images, and ideas shared as an anxious public seeks both comfort and the capacity to understand the unfolding complexities of daily life. Indeed, were we to design a course proposing solutions to problems related to COVID-19, it would involve every field in the academy, from biology to economics to film to physical education. If we're wise, Hanstadt continues, we'll use this moment to help our students better understand the complexity of the world beyond the walls of academe, the ways in which our various fields and disciplines not only overlap, but also influence and shape and reshape each other in substantive ways. If we're smart, we'll use this moment to foreground those messy interactions, asking students to explore such interrelations to parse cause and effect to unfold how data influences poetry and how poetry can shape our ability to give meaning to data. I can think of no better way to end than with this poem by Liz All. Image number 14-2383, Apollo 8. Sometimes the best laid mission plan, tidy and typed in carbon triplicate, will miss something. Even with the laser vision of all those eyes. Sometimes the mission itself shifts as it unfolds, as you're breathless in the thrill of hitting goals no one had thought to set down on paper. For instance, if you're prepping to be the first guys to fly out to the moon, not land on it, just everything but, you'll have studied your lunar maps, the photographs snapped by the machines sent in advance, who knew only to obey the crude code with which they were programmed. And NASA will have outfitted you with all the best cameras and lenses they could find, and a list, such a list, of targets to capture in color and black and white. Rills, craters, debris fields, potential landing sites, boulders, valleys, constellations. But your exhaustive and specific list will omit one simple thing, and you won't realize it until on the third lunar orbit, freshly trimmed from an eclipse to a circle, and heads up for the first time, you see the Earth, rising improbably, fantastically, from beneath the moon's horizon. You're so well-trained that your initial impulse is to stick to mission, stick to ticking off that list everybody agreed on back there on the ground. But the Earth, the Earth is coming up over the moon, rising like the moon, like the sun, like, like nothing you have a metaphor for, and you are so well trained that you can still reach just past the mission-bound edges of that training and snap the color photographs not on the checklist, the photographs no one knew would need to be taken. The now you ubiquitous, whole earth, blue and borderless and feathered with clouds dangling in the void. Our precariousness, our 
us-ness, no longer an abstraction. Who knows what lunar ravine, what highlands or nameless Maria lost their place in the queue so that everything we knew could shift into new focus, so we could be remade, albeit briefly, by just a glance at this first true likeness of ourselves.